Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Come on in. Have a seat. More seats over here. We have some more seats over here on the right. On my right, your left. Come on in. We have a couple seats in the front, a couple seats in the middle. Just like on Southwest, seats in the middle. Are <laughs> yeah. If you're late, you get a middle seat. seat. That's right. The C boarding group. Come on in. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, welcome. My name's Howard Kalugian, and my wife Martha and I would like to welcome you to our place. We're very thankful that you're all here. We'd like to thank AFP for putting on such a tremendous event. Isn't this fantastic to yeah. have yeah. AFP here and all the food and drinks and everything that they provide? I think this is the third year that we've been doing the Pine Tree Riot celebration. <laughs> And I think you're in for a treat if you haven't been to one before. You're going to learn a little bit about history, a little bit about local history, and about how that applies to today, and about what we need to learn from that story in history. So we still have a few seats over here if you'd like. Now there's uh, just some housekeeping items. The food, as you, you've probably already found. Uh, the, there's an outhouse if you go out past the last shed on the left over here, outside of the barn. And uh, with that, we're going to we're going to get started with a pledge of allegiance. I know that there's uh, there are several flags that are upstairs. Is there one behind me? Right there, right here. Right here. There we go. So those of you in elected office, you might want to follow the lead of those of us who know the pledge. <laughs> yes, we can practically have a caucus, don't you know? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our master of ceremonies, Greg Moore. First of all, I, I want to say uh, I, how much we really appreciate Howard and Martha for giving us the opportunity to host this event here. Uh, one of the things that we said is, you know, we, we enjoyed having it in the town hall. The town hall was a, a fantastic location. Uh, but you know what, this has a, such a great intimate feel to it. And moreover, moreover, one of the things by having it here we were able to do is to actually bring some Abel Ebenezer beer. And I thought, you know, we made, we made a little bit of a commitment to, 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 uh, to the Pine Tree Riot by having this event every year. But when you name your company after the Pine Tree Riot, <laughs> I think that, that's more commitment than, than, than we're making. So uh, I, I want to first of all I want to say thank you to Howard. I know Howard. For those of you who don't know, Howard uh, actually also served in the legislature, but he actually had a little bit bigger district than some of the folks here. He was in California. He had about half a million people he represented when he served in California Assembly. Um, and I know how much of an appreciation he has for uh, legislative memorabilia. So one of the things I got Howard and, and Martha was, it's actually a, a commemorative special edition 200 uh, anniversary coin of the New Hampshire uh, State House. Two, this is the 200th year of the, uh, of the wow. State House, uh, bicentennial. And so I want to give this to Howard. Very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I think Howard will get, be giving some tours later to show some other uh, <laughs> legislative memorabilia. Uh, we really enjoy this event, and part of the reason I enjoy it is because when I said we should do something about the Pine Tree Riot, my staff looked at me and said, huh? <laughs> they really weren't sure what I was talking about. And it was a little disconcerting because a lot of my staff were born and raised here in New Hampshire, and they had no idea about this hugely important event that led to the uh, American Revolution that happened right here in Weir, New Hampshire. 246 years ago and where yeah where I can't tell you how many times I've made that joke and heard that joke today so let's keep it going let's keep it going uh, and 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 I said to myself if I'm surprised that the, so many people and I began asking some of our actors so what do you guys know about the pine tree riot and I get a blank look and it, it was so disappointing because this really is uh, one of those events where, had it not been for the Pine Tree Riot, uh, we might we might be uh, enjoying soccer and, and uh, using the pound, not the dollar. So, uh, and I don't enjoy soccer, by the way. Sorry for those soccer fans out there. And uh, and I, and I think that, that it's that we don't take the time to recognize just how important this event was in our history. Um, it really was. Some people describe it as the first organized event of resistance against the crown and some of the mandates made by the crown. 
And it really set the, the, the stage, it, without question, set the stage for the Boston Tea Party about 15 months afterwards. So a little bit of history about the Pine Tree Riot for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Early on, as many people know, Great Britain was a superpower. It was a superpower precisely because, uh, exactly because it was a naval superpower. And one thing about navies back in the, in the 16th, 17th century, they required a lot of wood. And so in the process of becoming a naval superpower, Great Britain had just deforested pretty much all of, all of the British Isles. They were pretty much deforested. But the good news for them is they had this wonderful resource known as the United States that was packed to the gill with trees everywhere. And particularly this area, New Hampshire, as we know, is, is as you're going to hear about a little bit later from someone who knows something about it, is a fantastic place to grow trees and grow wood. And so one of the things that happened was in, in the 17th century, they passed a law that said any tree above a 24-inch diameter was the property of the king. And he needed them to make mass. Yes, and white pines, 24 inches, they belonged to the king. And then they would come onto your property and they'd mark it with a broad arrow. Now, this wasn't really a problem because, as you can see, a tree that's, that's this thick, if you're not really going to go for that one first because you chop that sucker down. Good luck getting it out. You need a team of oxen and you still got to get it out of, still need to get it out of the woods. And so that really wasn't that big a deal for a lot of the, a lot of the uh, New Hampshire residents. But then in 1722, they, the New Hampshire General Court, and this is not the finest day of the New Hampshire General Court, by the way, for those members that are here present now, they pass a law to take 24 inch down to 12. And 12 inch, 12 inches di diameter wood was suddenly now property of the king. Now this is hitting right to home. This is what you, this is what you use for fuel, this is what you use to build your homes, for tools, everything, everything in modern existence at the time depended on white pine 12 inches or more. And suddenly all that became the property of the king and it was no longer the property of you on your land. And the surveyor of the, wo of the woods would come onto your land, mark it with a broad arrow, and, and from now on that, those trees on your property would no longer belong to you. Well, this didn't go over so hot. Let's, let's put it mildly. Now there was a little bit of an incident out in uh, what is now, what is now uh, Fremont. It was called the Mass Tree Riots. Uh, that incident sort of set the stage for, for the governors of New Hampshire to just sort of say, you know what, we passed this law, but we're not going to enforce it so much because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's too much trouble and when our, with our surveyors coming onto people's lands and being threatened to be killed, it's probably not such a great deal. <laughs> and just to put it in perspective, the penalty for taking one of the king's trees was between five and 50 pounds. Now, 50 pounds now is still a lot of money. Can you imagine what 50 pounds was back in 1722? That was an enormous tax that would be placed on anyone who was trying, trying to just uh, build a home or something to that effect. So this, this law went, went, uh, went basically, it, it wasn't enforced until 1776. A new governor came along, Governor Wentworth, and he said, hey, you know what? I get this great idea. This is a great way to raise revenue. Let's just start really starting to enforce this law. And it started slowly. And then in 1771, they said, we're really going to take this seriously. And they sent the surveyor of the wood out, and he went out, and he came around here to Goffstown, to four mills in Goffstown, and two mills here in, in Ware. And they, sh sure enough, they found all sorts of white pine with the king's broad arrow marked on it. They were being milled and ready to be used for, for people's homes. And of course, of course, they, they of course charged the people for violating that. Now, the four mill owners in Goffstown just paid their fine. They rolled over. Not, not Goffstown shining is most shining day, Rick. I'm just wanting to toss it out there. <laughs> just, that's not that's not that wasn't the best the best showing for you guys. Um, and but but the mill owner of the two mills in Ware, a fellow by the name of Ebenezer Mudget, said, "No way, no way. This is an unjust law, and we're not doing it." So on April 13th of 1772, the uh, the, the sheriff the sheriff uh, of, of Hillsborough County, Sheriff Whiting, came down. Uh, with his with his deputy Quigley, they came down. They showed up at, at the mill and they said, "Pay your fine," and and still Ebenezer Mudge refused, and they arrested him. But it was later in the evening, and they couldn't really do anything with the with the arrest. So they sent him home for house arrest in hopes that he he would actually change his mind and just pay his fines. And they went up to uh, Quimby's Inn, which is. If you go up 114, you'll see it. There's a nice millstone right on 114. I think it's a pink building with an Avon now, which probably is a little different from Quimby's in it today. And and they went in, and they went and, and and stayed there. The sheriff and his deputy. Well, Ebenezer got a bunch of his friends together. They all came over to his house. It was uh, 
answers vary. It was somewhere between 20 and 40 individuals. They decided, what are we going to do? Some of them said, should we help raise bail? Others said, let's fight this. Ultimately, the people who said, we're going to stand and fight prevailed. They won the day. They went in, they paint themselves in blackface, and on dawn of April 14th, they, they went and showed up at Quimby's Inn. And at that point in time, at that point in time, they decided to uh, show their lack of appreciation to the sheriff and his deputy. That involved coming in, breaking in. The sheriff reached for his pistols, but they disarmed him because he was overwhelmed. And they decided to, they said, take some switches and count off all the penalties themselves. <laughs> the sheriff suggested that he thought he was going to die. Um, they then in turn took the sheriff and his deputies, put them on their horses, and took the horses, cropped their ears, shaved their manes and tails, and sent them on their way. And, uh, and, and that was the Pine Tree Riot. They, there was a, a group of organized New Hampshire citizens saying, we're not going to put up with this unjust law. We're going to stand and fight. The sheriff later went back, raised the posse. Uh, they came out, and actually the general came out, and they, they arrested eight of, eight, of, eight of the members uh, who had participated. Here's the important part. Here's the important part. The, uh, the, the eight uh, people who were arrested ultimately were, were brought to the face of court in August of, of 1772. And because it's English common law, they had a chance to, to stand up and, and defend themselves. And the justices, the justices decided that uh, that at the at the end of the day, the penalty for doing this should be twenty shillings. <laughs> That's like a parking ticket for nearly beating a sheriff and deputy down. <laughs> So that, that was, there was a message sent. It was a message sent by the judges about what they thought about this law as well. That word, when word from that reached, reached uh, far out, out into places like Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, people got the message that if you stand up to your rights, even if they come and punish you, there are people who believe to also believe this is not just law. There's no question that it unequivocally led to the Boston Tea Party, who then also had people who dressed up, went in, engaged in civil, civil disobedience. Now they weren't caught, <laughs> but uh, but they, they, part of the reason they felt comfortable enough doing it was because the penalty was so lenient on on the New Hampshire citizens who engaged in civil disobedience, and that really is a pine to right, and that spirit in New Hampshire. Uh, that led to that led to this notion that you can stand up against uh, unjust laws and have the willingness to stand for what's right really drove the day, and that that spirit is something that we that we fight for with Americans for Prosperity as well. We say, look, we will work within the system. We're not going to go and beat up sheriffs and deputies. No, we're not. It's really we're true. We're not. Um, I know. Um, and, but we're going we're gonna to work to fight unjust laws. We're going to work to fight unjust ta taxation. We're going to work to stop people taking your, your property away from you. And we stand up every day, whether it's fighting, for civil fighting against civil asset forfeiture, whether it's against cutting, cutting taxes and spending, whether it's about, about allowing people to keep more of their own money, not the government's money. And that's what we do every single day in Americans for Prosperity. We're so thrilled that, that here in New Hampshire, a number of legislators here, and I applaud you, You've, you've made some substantial uh, tax reductions in the last the last four years. I can't tell you it, it and I tell you, after we saw the tax growth tax relief, the, the amount of people working in New Hampshire went up like like a, a parabola. It just took off. Right now, there are more people working in New Hampshire than ever before in history. More people in the workforce than ever before. Since the tax relief began in, in January one of 2016, 25,000 of our friends and neighbors are, are now working. Pulling them, giving themselves a life of opportunity, a, lot, a life of promise, thanks to, to good policy decisions. And those policy decisions are continuing. Thankfully, thankfully, it's not a lot of great news out of, out of Washington, but something happened last year. We actually saw some tax relief and some tax reform. And that tax relief and tax reform is leading to better, better lives and better outcomes for people all across, all across America, and we are so thankful. And we're so thankful to the many, many of you who come and help us in that effort. We are a volunteer-driven organization. We can't do it by ourselves. We need you. And I can't tell you how thankful I am to each and every one of you who've taken the time, whether it's writing a letter to the editor, picking up a phone and calling people, knocking on a door, having a conversation with a legislator, or if you are a legislator, doing the right thing when you're up in Congress, even when everybody else is telling you to do the wrong thing. And I can't tell you the, how much how much courage that takes on a day-to-day -day basis. And you guys deserve a ton of pre credit. So I'd like to I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to all of you. I, I, you guys are the best.
But I, one thing I know for certain is you didn't come here to hear me. Um, we have a rock star, and he's been a rock star with AFP for going on 10 years now. And he has been, he's been here longer than I was. The best decision Corey, Corey Lewandowski ever made. The best decision Corey Lewandowski ever made when he became the, the first state director with Americans for Prosperity. So he put a phone call into, to Tom Thompson and said, Tom, would you be our honorary chair? Tom is, is a hero. He's been doing this for years and years and years. Back from when his days when his father was governor, and he's continued that legacy of, of ensuring that New Hampshire not only remains sales and income tax free, but remains the government remains small and people's liberty remains high. And not only that, but he knows a lot about trees. So with that, I'd like, uh, I'd like to introduce our honorary chairman, our rock star, Tom Thompson. I think I told Greg last year if he calls me a rock star again, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Greg, uh, for that acknowledgement. <laughs> I am a certified tree farmer, uh, and I can honestly tell you, as much as I enjoy being here with my wife, Sheila, uh, that I would much rather be in the backwoods on our tree farm than down in Concord testifying or uh, going to different meetings. But I understand that it's important and if you're not at the table, you lose by default. So I'm more than willing to do that. And uh, again, I thank you. I thank all the legislators that are here and just echo what Greg said. Uh, it's really important uh, for what you've been doing not only to those that are in office now, but those and our famous speaker, Bill O'Brien, and others that have served before us, and, uh, and some that are looking to serve. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, I know it's a big commitment on your part and your family. I was talking to uh, Speaker O'Brien before we uh, started the meeting, and we both agreed that these wagon wheels look like the wagon wheels that came off Hillary Clinton's campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> uh, I was going to actually say a, a few things about the Pine Tree Riot, but uh, this gentleman just uh, took everything away from me. Sorry. But as a tree farmer, um, I can kind of relate, and our son is in the logging business also, and can relate to some of those people way back then. Um, we basically did the th same thing. We cut the trees, we got them to the mills and sawed them out. Um, today, uh, instead of using a whipsaw, which they called back then, uh, either oxen or horses to get them to the mills, and then uh, so the early, early mills were just up and down sawmills that uh, were run by water power. Today we have highly computerized, mechanized equipment uh, with a, just a machine that does the cutting could probably cut more wood in a day than two men could cut all year. I mean, it's incredible. But the, uh, the cost of that equipment is also incredible. The, uh, <coughs> Greg mentioned the, the two trees, uh, the size of the white pines that uh, the king wanted. And at first they started out with a 24 inch and they actually wanted even bigger trees. That was the smallest diameter because those masts, they wanted straight single tree masts. And uh, they were actually, I guess, uh, putting two or three uh, stems together because they didn't have much left over there. Uh, but when they saw these white pines, uh, they, that's what they wanted. And then they got worried because maybe they were gonna do the same thing. They were gonna cut all the big trees. So they passed the law for the 12 inch tree, white pine. So that would be their growing stock for, for uh, the future. And that's what really set off, uh, I think the, uh, the landowners, the loggers and the mill owners. In this 24 inch, it, a 24 inch diameter, 16 feet long. That's a typical log that you see on a, on a truck today. There's 425 total board feet 
once it's sawed out. And the white pine, it's 12 inches in diameter, 16 foot long, would be 95 board feet. There's a huge difference. And so the other thing that uh, the surveyors would come in and they had to mark the trees, but then if the landowner wanted to go and cut some of his trees, they had to pay a tax to do that on their own land. And that was, and I can tell you as a landowner and as, as a tree farmer, I could at that point say enough is enough. And, and, and I'm sure when the uh, uh, Ebenezer Mudgett and others uh, got the, the fines, uh, especially Ebenezer, said that's enough. And he got his uh, different friends together and they, they set the plan together. And I'm sure that there was some hard cider uh, <laughs> that evening. <laughs> so that's, it, it's an interesting story. It was really, in my opinion, and I think everyone else would, you know, think the same. That was the spark that, that uh, really started to ignite the fire that, that brought us to the Tea Party and then to the American Revolution. And it's a, it's a piece of history that uh, should be uh, promoted more and, and uh, you know, maybe next year we can do a, a, a story for uh, all the papers and get it out there and, and, and some pictures that kind of give people some ideas of what really went on there. And I, I also, before I end, I wonder if we got to that similar point today uh, if there would be the courage that those men had or those people had back then to say to our government, enough is enough. Thank you. Now, one of the things uh, where Tom has a little disagreement with me is the fact that we actually name our Conservative of the Year Award the Tom Thompson Conservative of the Year Award. And Tom doesn't think that's appropriate because he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we did it nonetheless, and, and thanks for all the great leadership he's given this chapter since it started back in uh, 2008. Uh, but our most recent conservative of the year uh, is, uh, is J.R. Hull. And I gotta tell you, I really, appreciate, uh, I really appreciate the hard work he's put forward over the course of the last few years to make sure that taxes remain low and government remains limited. So with that, I'd like to introduce our 2017 Thank you, everybody. I'll make this short. As I look around the barn, I see a lot of reasonably square beans, and although not all of them are pine, there's a couple new ones that are pine. There's a lot of them that are hemlock, but they were all built out of trees that were bigger than 12 inches in diameter. And all of us need to stand up and protect our rights. Um, today we lost a bill by one vote again. I was teaching a class just six weeks ago for people who were considering running for office and there was nine bills this session alone where the final vote was decided by less than four or five House members. Out of a House of 400, four or five people were making the decisions on where this state goes. We can do better than that. We can make sure that people who are interested in running for office, get the support and, um, that they need to be able to run for office, whether that's knocking on doors or helping them make phone calls or even taking care of their kids so they can go out and campaign. But long term, our state is, is really dependent upon the volunteers that are willing to put their time at, in at the State House, be it either the House or the Senate. So I would ask that you strongly think about, and if you can't run yourselves, help find the people necessary to fill those positions, because every year when we go to look for people to run for the House, it's hard to find 400 House members. So, With that, I'll end my remarks, but please, please, it matters. These votes that come up are decided by only a few people, and we've had a number of places where seats are uncontested. So, thank you. Hey, tell me I need to speak up loud because you can't hear me in the back, so if I seem like I'm yelling into the microphone, you'll know why. Uh, you know, I like to always wrap up with a nice, cheery, uplifting message, 
Um, that's why uh, we, we decided to go. We decided to go with someone who I know is going to be really positive and, re and really drive this message <laughs> home. This is my old boss, um, someone who won our 2014 AFP Conservative of the Year. Actually, not the Tom Thompson Conservative of the Year at the time, Tom. Sorry, um, but uh, he he has done yeoman's work in setting the stage for our economic growth and recovery that we are seeing right now. I honestly believe that were it not for our next speaker, we would not be seeing the huge gains that we're seeing today. Were it not for someone to, to say, listen, I, we have to turn off the music and get the people down off the tables and hold the line and stand for something and stand for a principle back in 2011 and say no more, we wouldn't be able to sit here to say we are having the strongest economy in the Northeast, by far the strongest economy in the Northeast. It takes courage. It takes the courage of the men who uh, came out and participated in the Pine Tree Ride. It takes the courage of people to stand up and say no. I know there are a number of members who served in 2011 who are here today, and you guys walked through fire. You guys walked through, literally walked through hundreds, of, if not thousands of people on the State House lawn. And, and I see, I see I'm looking right back at Lynn, Lynn and Ralph and watching you nod your head. You remember those days. It was tough, but that courage has paid off. And with that, I'd like to introduce a guy who I think uh, led to a revolution here in New Hampshire, a little quieter than Sam Pease and Mudgets, but Bill O'Brien. Greg, I warned you because you used to write all my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak, and JR, looking at the two of us, I think I'm going to actually make it a little bit shorter, right? <laughs> you know, and, and Tommy, you know, one of the real pleasures of being involved in public life is, is meeting you and being um, reminded of all you do and all that your father did. It is truly an honor to know you and, and to uh, become acquainted with you. you know, one of the things I want to get across to folks is we are a revolutionary pe people. What happened with the Pine Tree Riot was not out of character for us. Fighting arbitrary and oppressive government is at the core of our history, and it's in the DNA of our political process. Over a hundred years before the Pine Tree Riot, the, the rioters' great-grandfather's generation beheaded the king. And they beheaded the king because the king thought he was superior, supreme, to constitutional government. And later, about 85 years, before the Pine Tree Riot, the king's grandson, Charles the uh, First, I think it was, um, no, it was James the Second, um, forgot the lesson of a constitutional monarchy. So they threw him out of the country and went and got a Dutch prince to be their king. It is our right as free individuals to throw out and challenge oppressors wherever we see them. It is for that reason that the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms is in both the U.S. Constitution and the New Hampshire Constitution. But we don't have that right just because they're in the Constitution. As Justice Scalia explained in the, in the recent case of District of Columbia versus Heller, it is our natural right to defend ourselves. It is our, our historical common law right to defend ourselves from tyrants, domestic or foreign. The Pine Tree Rioters understood that. The founders of our country understood that when four years later they declared ourselves as being independent from a tyrannical England. The framers of our state constitution understood that when 12 years later they put this language into our constitution language that is still in our Constitution. It is Article 10. You know what the name of that article is? The Right of Revolution. And in it it says, whenever the ends of government are perverted and public liberty manifestly is endangered and all other means of redress are ineffectual, the people may and ought to reform government or establish a new government. Then it goes on to say it and make it clear what is being, uh, the message that's being given. The doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the common good and the happiness of mankind. 
These are people speaking in the 17, 1784, 12 years after the Pine Tree Riots. They understood, and we shouldn't forget. But the question comes up, is this right of revolution exists now? What, can we recapture the certainty and the courage of the glorious revolution that threw out a king and said, we'll try another one from, from the Netherlands? Or the certainty and the courage of the Pine Street rioters? I submit to you that it can. I submit to you it's around us all the time. And I'll tell you where you see it. You see it, the revolutionaries, in town meetings, speaking up in, in the face of neighborhood or community opposition for small government low taxes and lo low regulations in order to preserve their liberty. We see it in revolutionary parents protecting their children from state propaganda and collective oppression uh, through homeschooling. And when they can't do that, they, they fight the educational industrial complex in their towns and in Concord. We see revolutionary candidates for public office and their supporters explaining to the voters why and how government should shrink. We see revolutionary state legislators who labor year after year for freedom and refuse to join the too often the majority dedicated to growing government so that they can grow their authority over you. Legislators such as the one that exists in this district who would take away educational uh, savings accounts because they want government to have a monopoly over our children. We see revolutionaries and the activists who overcome insults and obstacles and stay with their conviction and labor year after year for freedom, religious freedom, political freedom. Those folks who stay with it are, are, are revolutionaries. We see revolutionaries who refuse to believe the lies of the legacy media and take the time to learn the truth themselves and to pass it on to others. There are many Pine Tree Rioters with us here today. Each of us should be a Pine Tree, a pine tree Rioter. The times demand nothing less. Each of us needs to be a revolutionary. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to be here for a while. There is plenty of food. Uh, uh, it, it's like the first rule of Fight Club is no one talks about Fight Club. The first rule of Pine Tree Riot event is everyone has to take some food home with them. Uh, for those of you who would like a, a photo with uh, Tom Thompson's legendary axe, uh, Tom has always been gracious in that regard. You, you might even get a photo with Tom in it. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who want to stick, uh, mingle, chat, please do. Enjoy yourselves. And I appreciate everyone for coming out. Thank you so much.